some one of the legislators got up to the microphone and said, so if we pass this bill and 120 days goes by and the governor, let's say for some reason we can't meet back here, there's some kind of lockdown and we can't meet back here, then we're going to lose our federal funding. And I think that really? was, I think that was the clincher. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us here on Tactics, where speech isn't violence, tolerance isn't love, and disagreement isn't hate. If you like the program, be sure to like and subscribe. That helps us fight off the dark cyber overlords at YouTube, so certainly do that if this is something that you are interested in. Now, my next guest is somebody who has been on the show quite frequently. In fact, uh, it's a shame that we weren't able to continue that because of my own uh, issues with grad school and not being able to do the show as often as I'd like, but uh, back in the days of yore, we actually used to have a weekly segment on this show where she would come in and give us a rundown of what is going on in the legislature. So it is time once again to go to our guest, Becky Gerritsen of Eagle Forum, Alabama. Thank you for being on the program with us again. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be back. Yeah, it's great to have you back. And, and one thing that I wanted to uh, ask you about, you know, the, the way that I was going to format this is I hate to squeeze what has now been months of deliberation into basically one segment, but that's kind of the Herculean task that we find ourselves in. So uh, real quick before we dive into sort of our overview of what has been happening in the Alabama halls of Congress over the past session, uh, what was today like? What, what all happened recently? Well, today was day 30, the last day of the session, and they are at recess right now. So they got through, there were 18 bills, I believe, on the special calendar, special order calendar. Mm -hmm. They are about halfway through. The first bill was to ban vaccine passports, and that took three and a half hours to get through that bill. So it's a long day. It's good that they will go probably until midnight tonight, and it's been very frustrating. One of the bills that would have helped us not have to have mandatory vaccines was killed. Um, so anyway, we'll get into that later, but it has been a crazy day. And let me just say, yep. summing up this session has been extremely frustrating for the public, but also for us who work up there. And I am a registered lobbyist in my position as executive director for Eagle Forum. Mm -hmm. And we have had such limited access to our representative. It's been very, very frustrating. Their phones are so full, their voicemails, you can't leave a voicemail mm -hmm. because those are full. They admit that they get so many emails, they, they can't read them all. And then they don't wander the halls because the public is not allowed to be on the floors where their offices are. And so it has just been, if it's hard for a lobbyist um, who's not a well, the well-funded lobbyists are having no problem being up there every day. <laughs> That's how it always us, is, isn't it? You know, who are grassroots, um, really fighting for conservative causes, we are having a much more difficult time. And it's just makes me mad for the public that if we're having a hard time, we kind of know how things work up there. It's especially maddening. And we've had so many very important bills that have come through this year and that needed a lot of public input. So I really hope that next year is nothing like this year. Yeah. And that's the thing that I think has been frustrating for a lot of people too. Now, obviously in this specific context, uh, context that you're talking about, uh, it's true, but I think it's been true on the broader sense in a lot of ways, too, that things that are just sort of relegated as COVID safety are actually just very convenient veils to do things that they've always wanted to do. Yeah. And I, I kind of think that that's probably what you're running into up there at the, the House. Yes, and it was really apparent in the very beginning of the session because so many legislators, what I would talk to on the phone or via text or they were loving the session because they were having to deal with any of the public. And they, it, this, is the, this is the best year we've had so far. And all of us are thinking this is the worst year. I've worked with people who have, you know, for decades been working up there as lobbyists and as attorneys, you know, trying mm -hmm. to help with these bills. And they said this is the worst year they have ever experienced. Well, you know, yeah, being a congressman, that. that's that's pretty easy when you don't have to deal with the little peons out and, you know, out and yeah. uh, slap out and... With you don't even have to hear them on the on the telephone because your voicemail is too full that you can just completely ignore them. Right, and unfortunately, I think that that's again kind of what they've they've always wanted, and because of that, that they probably saw it in that 
light, but uh, just to, to kind of get into the overview that we wanted to talk about here, out of all the bills that you've dealt with this year, and I know that Eagle Forum Alabama does as much as they can, but they can't deal with every little issue that comes up, uh, of the bills that you specifically worked with, which ones are you most excited about that have now passed? I think one that passed today, well, there's a couple, but one that passed today that was very, very important was a ban on vaccine passports. Mm -hmm. This would allow the citizens to be able to move freely, to buy and sell and, and go to different venues without having to prove that they've had a COVID vaccine. Mm -hmm. This was a bill that passed out of the Senate uh, several weeks ago, and it was a great bill uh, the way it passed out of the Senate. It came down to the House Health Committee and higher education and the medical community got a hold of it. And they said, well, that's good for everybody else, but our employees and our students or the people that we want to serve, we're going to want to have, we want to be able to mandate that they have a vaccine, which went so far as to say, if you were a patient and you wanted to go to a hospital to have a procedure done, this bill would allow them to say, no, I'm sorry, you can't get your services done here until you get a COVID vaccine. And that is just not right. And there are many young nurses and doctors who aren't all about the vaccine, who are in childbearing years mm -hmm. and realize this is an experimental vaccine. They don't want to have to take it. So our big thing was to get those two amendments ripped off, get it back to the Senate version. That mostly happened today. However, higher ed does have an exemption that allows them to require, see, they pretty much already can re require a vaccine record when the students come to school. Right, for things they like tetanus have and policies. Whatnot. It's not a law, but it's a policy. So this law today basically says you can continue to do that policy that you've been doing, but and you can't add any new vaccines to that. So that's good. And you couldn't... Um, require them to have to have a vaccine passport. Now we'll see what they do. It's a policy they can make, so they may try to, to do that. But again, I think we have to really be vigilant with this and people who have kids going to school and going to college, pay attention because these are childbearing years. And right now it is against the federal law to mandate that these vaccines be given because they still are technically experimental. Mm -hmm. And that goes against the Geneva, not the Geneva Convention, the um, Nuremberg Code. So stand tall if you're a parent and whip out that Nuremberg Code if you need to. You can go to americasfrontlinedoctors.com and you can see your rights as a parent and as a person that you cannot, your employer cannot mandate that. It's against the, the federal law. But people are being bullied. People don't know that. So I think that one is, is probably one of the best that passed so far. Now, we'll one see. one thing I'd like you to explain on that, just for the audience, um, this bill, does it specifically deal only with government entities? So it's dealing just with, uh, or, is, or is it broader? Does it affect it private broader. businesses? Yes. It is a very short bill. It's only about two pages long, but it mm -hmm. does also say that businesses cannot require their customers to show a vaccine passport when they come in. So they still may ask that question. They still may want to take your temperature. You know, they, those things they still may ask. They still may require you to wear a mask when you come into their store, but they are not allowed. It's against the law in Alabama for them to require proof or documentation that you've had a COVID vaccine. You know, and I was surprised that a bill like that would even be required because I would have thought automatically it would be not, you would not be able to do that because of HIPAA violations. But. Exactly. And that's a big question that a lot of people are having is, wait a minute, this, they're not allowed to ask you these kind of questions. Right. So we'll see. I think there are going to be a lot of lawsuits that will be coming uh, in multiple states and we'll, we'll see how this plays out. Yeah. And my natural instinct on that really is to say, look, if the business wants to require it, the business should be allowed to require it. But when we're talking about health, I do see where there's a, a little bit of a strain there because we already do have HIPAA laws in place. And if that's the case and they can't require you to show your medical records for anything else, I don't know why we would make this one specific carve out for this one specific vaccine. And so... Uh, yes. I, I do understand the rationale underneath that. Okay, so of the bills that, that did pass, which ones are you most upset that wound up passing? Which one passed oh, that you didn't want so, passed? 
So glad you asked that question. <laughs> As you know, all of last year and this year, we had a bill that we helped write called the Vulnerable Child Compassion and Protection Act. Right. This was for gender-confused children who, at the age of eight and younger, I believe, in Alabama, at least age eight, they might even go younger, um, they are able to get onto puberty blockers with the purpose of trying to change their sex. Now, I want you to think about this. This is a third grade person. Mm -hmm. um, the doctors are giving them puberty blockers, and then they go on to cross-sex hormones, which will then prepare them for sex reassignment surgeries. All our bill does is say if you are a healthy child and you are trying to change your sex, you have to wait until you're 19 to have this done. Because we are seeing all across the country and all across the world, people who have made these decisions at a very young age or whose parents have made this decision for them at a very young age are realizing that, oh my gosh, I was just a kid. I didn't know what I was doing. I was caught up in a trend. Mm -hmm. I was caught up in YouTube. And now I wish I wouldn't have done it. But forever, their lives will be dependent on prescription drugs. Their bodies are mangled and basically healthy body parts have been amputated. So this was very much a common sense bill. And last year we were making great progress, but COVID shut us down. So we got it passed in the Senate, but not in the House. This year it passed in the Senate very early on, like 23 to four. It was a very good, I mean, it passed with flying colors. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, it was one of the first Senate bills that did pass. It was, it was early March, I believe, early right. March when it passed. So, yeah, I think we were week four into it, and we're at, like, week 13 now. So mm -hmm. the, the votes in the House were there, were ready. Um, this was a no-brainer kind of bill. Yes, it would be controversial, the human rights campaign and several the LGBT crowd, of course, they were pushing very hard against this bill. UAB runs the gender clinic, so, of course, they don't want to be shut down. Um, but what happened is last Friday, you know, well, the speaker had promised that he would get this on the, on the calendar. Well, last Thursday, day 29 of day, you know, there's 30 days in the session. It was the second to the last bill on the calendar. Well, they only got through one or two bills that day. Brand new calendar comes out for today and it's not on there. So our call was to the governor and to the speaker, and we sent out emails to all of our members and said, please call the governor's office and call the speaker and ask them to get it on a second special order calendar today. So there is a slight possibility that it could come up tonight. We've talked to people on the rules committee and just begged them, please, these children, I, Caleb, it's so important to know, gender confused children, if they are allowed to go through natural puberty, by the time they are a young adult, 98% of them come out on the mm -hmm. other side just fine. Yep. But if you're going to give them all of these dangerous drugs that stop bone growth, that stop brain maturation, that it has so much to do with their physical bodies, you've just, you've ruined them. You've sterilized them, and now they're in their early 20s. And so my heart, I just wanted to cry, and I probably will have some crying time. We've worked so hard on this, and this is a no-brainer, and this will save a lot of children. And I'm just very disappointed that this is a Republican-run mm -hmm. state house we have. We have a super majority, yet we couldn't get this bill passed. That's just wrong. They're moral cowards. I mean, there's no yeah. – you've been a little gentler than I have, but they're moral cowards if they can't pass something like this. I mean, when you're looking at something where the average – life expectancy of a transgender person is almost half what it is for a normal human being. And it, you look at it, it's because of things like suicides and health issues that come with transitioning and health issues that come with puberty blocking. They have a higher risk of certain cancers. They have a higher risk of, of, of blood clot issues, things like yeah. that. And, and with all of those things, and we know for a fact, based on all the data that we have, that if we just leave them alone until they're 18, 90% of them will never have to go through that in their life. I, I yeah. don't understand the rationale of anybody, even someone that is pro-transgender or pro-homosexual. I don't even understand why they would not support a bill like this. I know right. that they and don't, they, but I don't understand it. They can still socially transition. They can change their name. They can change their pronouns. We are not 
trying to stop them from presenting as the opposite sex. We are trying to stop the medical harms mm -hmm. that are being done. And, you know, parents are being told these things are reversible. Oh, you just push a pause button. No, you don't. You push a pause button and then they it retards their growth while their peers move on, which makes them want to go to cross-sex hormone, which really jacks up their bodies. Mm -hmm. And it, it's just awful. And we know too many people that have gone through this and that are saying, please stop countries now i'm so excited to see sweden and england and many european countries now right not exactly the, bastions of conservatism either exactly but they are realizing the damage that is being done to these children and they're saying no we are not going to allow this to happen in our country and so we're thinking here we are in alabama you think that our people would wise up and realize this is just not this doesn't make any sense this is not healthy for these children so that's, uh, we're all just very, very upset. Yeah, and that's understandable. I mean, we could spend literally an entire episode, and you and I have both done interviews with, uh, you know, different people that have spoken on this. I very much encourage you to go to Eagle Forum Alabama's YouTube channel. Go to my YouTube channel. You can see, for example, our, our interview with Dr. Lappert, uh, who's fantastic. I could spend all day on this, but we've got to move on. I'll just okay. le leave you with this. Um, it seems to me that the people in the House of Representatives in the state of Alabama care more about what the press will say about them than they do about the lives of these kids. And I know that's harsh, but I, just based on their actions, that's the only thing that I can take from it. Actions do speak louder than words. You are so right. So on the rest of the session, yes. what is a bill that failed that you would have liked to have uh, seen passed that, that actually got you oh. know, railroaded? There's so many. Uh, well, Common Core, um, repealing Common Core, that would have been great. Of course, that bill has never moved. We did have one in the House this year, and it actually got a hearing for the first time in about nine years that, that it's been presented. But, of course, it went nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, the it, Born Alive bill. So if a child is born during an abortion, an attempted abortion, there was a very simple bill that would say this child must be given all the care a regular born child would be given to try to save their life. And again, we're, this is a Republican supermajority. It passed the Senate. I'm sorry, it passed the House with uh, pretty good flying colors mm -hmm. and was stuck in the Senate. So I don't, you know, I didn't see the special order calendar today. So don't quote me on that. There, There's a possibility it, it may come up today, but I did not hear that it was on for today and this is the last day right well that is truly unfortunate i mean and again this is kind of going back to the same sentiment that on the transgender bill i do not understand why even democrats that are pro-abortion are against this because this is a baby that is already born born he's yes. already out of the womb yes. and i i just don't understand the rationale of why you would oppose something like yes. that i mean i i thought that you know, Senator Doug Jones, who you and I are not political allies with, even he supported the Born Alive bill when it came up in the Senate. Yeah. And yeah. and so I just, I do not understand that rationale at all. Um, one of the, Caleb, go ahead. you were asking about which ones we wish would have passed. There was one that would ban the Confucius Institutes on college campuses. Mm -hmm. And this is a, a Chinese-backed group or um, program, actually, that, we give a lot of money to, we spent millions of dollars building a facility on Troy University. And again, mm -hmm. Confucius Institutes are being banned across the country because we are seeing that it's a spy network in some places. They come in, they're able to infiltrate, they're able to get research um, th through the universities. I'm not saying that that's exactly what's happening at Troy, but we do know that um, it is run by the Communist Party in China, and we would have loved to see that go away. Again, it got a, a little hearing in the House Education Committee, but it didn't go anywhere. It's very sad. Do you think the rationale on that one could have been, and, and I'm just you know playing devil's advocate here, do you think maybe some of our legislatures in the state of Alabama were just kind of thinking, okay, I understand the, the reason that people are cautious about this, but... Isn't this more like a national security issue? Should we really be dealing with this? Do you think maybe there was some hesitancy on their part because of that? Well, I think that a lot of the legislators have a loyalty to higher ed. Higher ed has a very big, they're very strong lobbying group there. And mm -hmm. I do think that they really pay attention. 
of course, sports is such a big deal in Alabama. And so what, really? We, we have a big sports thing here in Alabama? Yeah. <laughs> they get a lot of credit. And so I, I think that it's hard to find. If the college wants something or doesn't want something, they usually win. Mm. So that's a tough one. I, I could see that. I mean, I have often joked that Nick Saban is the most powerful man in the state of Alabama, and he is. There's, If Governor Ivey wants something and Nick Saban wants something, Nick Saban's going to win that fight. But yeah, anyway, probably right. probably right. I know it's sad, but it's true. So um, are, are there any bills that pass that shouldn't have? Oh, I'm sure there are hundreds, uh, but I don't know what they all are. There is, let's see, I just kind of picked the one. Here's one that I really liked that passed, the Biological Sports Bill. So this is- Ah, uh, yeah, I did see that. Well, and this would allow, so transgender girls, which is really a boy, um, competing with girls, which this really hurts women's sports. It takes away their scholarships and whatnot. I mean, we've all heard about this on the national news. And that did pass. And it actually passed with good margins in both the House and Senate. So I'm glad to see that. I'm glad that it was really a woman's rights issue. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm happy to see that that came along. Okay, gambling, that one was teetering for a long time. I'm very happy that it was killed for this session. It sure took a lot of time, which made it hard for us to get the other bills that we wanted passed. But I do think the governor will call back a se special session. Probably. I'm sure we can all read the writing on the wall that something will be coming Soon. Yeah, I don't know about you, Becky. You can you can tell me if you get the same sentiment or not. But I kind of feel like every year it just creeps a little bit closer to the finish line. And I, I just got to feel like even if it doesn't wind up getting through this year, that it's going to get through next year. We, we, ha we have had a gambling bill every year for the past like four or five years. And every single time we have it, it feels like it just gets a little bit closer to that finish line. Yeah. It definitely does get closer. And I... I'm suspect of the polling. They keep saying that, you know, everybody wants to have a vote. Well, a lot of people don't understand that when they give their, when they, because it's a constitutional amendment, mm -hmm. the public would have to vote on it. Right. But as soon as they do vote on it, and if they voted yes, then the gambling cartels, which as so far as it's been set up in these bills, there's a small group of people who will be making all of the decisions and you won't have a vote anymore. Mm -hmm. You're just basically vote, voting yes, I'm ready for you to take over and run gambling in our state. So I hope we can get that message out that voting for a lottery is going to open the doors to so much more. And Eagle Forum's really our biggest argument, well, we have several on gambling. One of them is that it hurts the poor. It is not a good way to fund government. You only get about 1% of your budget that is mm -hmm. helped by gambling. But the, the ills of the society are so much more than that. But the increase in sex trafficking is huge in casinos uh, once you open up a casino. And we already have a serious one. I was about to say, right? Alabama already has a really huge problem with that. We're already, a, uh, especially because of I-65 and 85 and sort of the intersection there, we're already a crossroads for that. We, cer we certainly are. So we uh, will continue to fight the gambling bill. Um, another one that was really huge that we fought, and of course, you may feel differently about this being a cancer patient. Um, right. We're against uh, dispensary marijuana. It's not medical marijuana. It is THC is THC. It's just uh, recreational versus medical. Mm -hmm. The only difference is the tax structure. So it is still THC. It did pass, and it was signed today by the governor. I We just really need to watch this one very closely. We know in every other state what follows is recreational, and a lot of society ills come from this. But... Based on the studies that we have been looking at, especially for pain, um, even for ALS, the, the marijuana, dispensary marijuana does not do the trick. It's pharmaceutical marijuana, THC, that does better. So we do have, and I don't know if you ever took Durabinol or Marinol when you were going. I did it. I was actually very lucky. My side effects from chemo were very mild. Oh, well, thank God for Amen. that. Amen. We do have, and we do have some great um, THC medications for epilepsy, and we just would really like to see more studies funded, mm -hmm. and I'm really nervous about where this is going to go. Well, you know, it's interesting because with both of the bills that you just mentioned, I can very easily see myself supporting either one of them just on libertarian uh, right. ideals. 
Uh, you should be able to spend your money the way you want to, even if it's on something dumb like gambling. And you should be able to put in your body more or less what you want to, especially if it's it's done under the the um, uh, under the institution of a prescription given by a medical doctor. My problem is with both of these bills, they're not set up right. And that's the problem that I have with them. I could see myself supporting a gambling bill as long as it was done correctly. But all this does is set up a government mandated, well, not a government mandated, but certainly a government sanctioned and enforced monopoly on yeah. with the gambling cartels. And then on the second side of that, with the, uh, the mer medical marijuana, it seems that this is more aimed at getting recreational marijuana in the door than it is at actually helping people that have these medical issues. Right. And you know what's something that's so amazing about this bill is if you're a medical doctor, you can just take a four hour class and pay $500 and boom, you can prescribe marijuana. I want you to think of all the doctors when they have a patient who has pain problems or you know, whatever they want to take it for, they're probably on a lot of prescription drugs already. Yeah, and, and if know. there's if there's a solution that is not a prescription drug that's actually natural like marijuana, I'm all for it. But, but we do have to figure out a way to do it correctly. And that you're going to have all kinds of issues coming with multiple drugs in a person's system, and now you're putting in medical marijuana, or not medical marijuana, but dispensary marijuana. Mm -hmm. And for a doctor who just went through a four-hour class, I mean, it's a Schedule One drug. It's highly, um, it makes a lot of, what am I trying to say? Your brain, it, it really affects your brain more than just any old regular drug. So this is going to be really interesting, Caleb. Yeah, and I'm not sure exactly where it's going to go. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll have to see. I, again, my instinct is to support it. And that's the, the issue that I'm running up against because I don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good, but at the same sure. time, I, I don't see this as actually doing what it's, it's stated that it's trying to accomplish. And, and that's, like I said, kind of the same issue I have with the gambling bill is that the effect of the bill would be the opposite of the intention of the bill. Right. Wouldn't it be great to just set up a study and you start trying some of these things and then you can collect the research at the same time and maybe we can... If it does work well and we know how to control it, we can fast track a drug like they did with Epidiolex. So I just think that would be a smarter way to go. Yeah, so I, I I have to agree. Um, now, granted, I, I'm no doctor, but that, that seems to be a, a more, just based on the very limited amount of research I've done on it, that does seem to be a, a better solution. So I wanted to ask you about this. Were there any bills that you feel like, and I think we kind of already touched on this, uh, are there any bills that you feel got timed out or are going to be pocket vetoed by the governor that you would like to see get through that, that you're worried won't? So this vaccine passport bill that passed mm. today, this would ban us from having to have passports in case you're just starting to watch this. Um, except, well, basically, that's it's going to protect you from having to have documentation. Mm. But the medical community and the colleges, mostly the medical community, they got stripped of what they wanted in the bill. So we understand that they are going to try to get the governor to veto this bill. But for the rest of us, we want the protection of not having to have a vaccine passport, especially if we need to go to the doctor and have a procedure done, but we're maybe of childbearing years, or maybe we just don't want to have the vaccine for whatever reason. Uh, you, maybe you've already had COVID. You don't need the vaccine. Right. And every study that's been done on it so far, now granted, it's a very new virus, so these studies are going to be preliminary, but every study we've done on it show, so far has shown that natural immunity is actually superior to the vaccine immunity. Yes. And that it can actually be dangerous to you to take the vaccine if you've already had COVID. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm worried that this might get vetoed by the governor. It is SB 267. So this week, I hope people will kind of pay attention um, I know this comes out on Thursday, so maybe even on Friday, call the governor's office and ask mm -hmm. her to support and sign SB 267 into law. Okay. Uh, one other thing I wanted to ask, and I, I know I know the Eagle Forum, this is not on your list of things that you looked at, but I just wanted to see if you had any inside information on this. Uh, the effort by the legislature to put forth legislation that curtails Governor Ivey's power or any oh. future governor's power when it comes to emergency situations, 
Uh, what has been done on that so far? Because everything that I've seen, it talks about them kind of drawing it up and it never really making it past the, the sort of planning stage. I'm so glad you brought that up because it, it, it was on my list and it, I kind of forgot about it. Okay, today we have a bill. It's called SB 97. Tom Wat Watley in the Senate actually mm -hmm. wrote this bill. Uh, Mike Holmes carried it in the House. It passed the Senate. Actually, in that bill was a section that would uh, not allow us to have mandatory vaccines. So we liked a lot of part, lot of this bill. Some of the parts we didn't like, but overall, we like it would have been put us in a better place. Mm -hmm. It failed on the floor right before we started filming today. So uh. this bill would have allowed the legislature to kind of rein back in the powers of the governor being able to declare a state of emergency. Mm -hmm. And again, this failed today, so we are in the same place that we've been. She can continue as the governor to make these decisions without the oversight of the legislature. You know, I'm I'm somewhat disappointed. And then there's part of me that's not because I know that if it wound up on Governor Ivy's desk, she was going to veto it automatically, like wouldn't give it a second thought anyway. But at the same time, I'm almost like, but if even the Congress, if nothing else out of sure jealousy to guard against its own power, couldn't yeah. step in and say, we need to limit the governor's ability to do this in the state of emergency, that blows my mind that even they were just like, no, we don't need to do that. We need to let the governor just be in charge. And I think a lot of it goes to, this is something that, I don't want to spend way too much time on this, but this goes back all the way to the founding of our country, the reason that we have uh, multiple houses in Congress, the reason that we have multiple branches of government, was ultimately because the founders cleverly believed that what would happen is that each branch would not let the other branch get too powerful because they would jealously guard their own power and their own authority. Uh, right. Sort of relying on people to be terrible, not people to be good, which has worked out better in our history. But the irony is now, I don't think the founders would have ever foreseen this. Now what is more important in American politics is not actually doing things, but instead staying out of the spotlight and avoiding responsibility and accountability. And if you're going to do that, the best way to do that is to veto things like this and, and actually have less power in your own office, and then when something terrible happens, like, oh, well, we can't do anything about that. That was the governor's call. And I, yeah. do you think maybe that's the reason that they, they voted against it? I, some, one of the legislators got up to the microphone and said, so if we pass this bill and 120 days goes by and the governor, let's say for some reason we can't meet back here, there's some kind of lockdown and we can't meet back here, then we're going to lose our federal funding. And I think that really? was, I think that was the clincher because, and then, yeah, yep, there was a procedural move that happened right after that, that I have never seen before. Um, anyway, yeah, I, the bill was heading along just fine until he said that. And then they decided to go back and take a vote that they'd already done. A procedural move was that was done. I had never seen before is actually what killed the bill. Hmm. Well, all right then. I, I don't really understand why the legislator would want to do that. Uh, at the because same, they don't want to lose federal funding. That I, I don't know. It's it, it's weird because I'm in the position of supposed to being able to understand things, and I find myself understanding less and less of why people do what they do. Uh, we're we're right living there. in very odd times. Yes, I'm right there with you. But ultimately, I I think that the. I said this at the time when Governor Ivey instituted, even back before we knew how dangerous this thing was, I was like, look, the, gov the governor just doesn't have the power to do that. Like, there is a correct way to do that in the sense that she could call an emergency session and get the legislature involved and have them pass a mask mandate or a shutdown, mm -hmm. but the governor cannot unilaterally do that. And the, the fact that there's no penalty or no uh, no means that anybody seems to have that is willing to take against the governor for doing that, that just astounds me. And, and the thing is, it's not because I have some kind of deep disdain for Governor Ivey. Um, sure. what, what happens if we had a governor that actually had malicious intent and had that same power? That's what I'm concerned about. Right. And that may happen. Uh, did you hear anything on the constitutional carry bill? 
The last I knew about the constitutional carry bill was it was it passed the House but was waiting in the Senate. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it made the calendar today. I don't think that it did because I remember when it passed in the House, I didn't see it ever come up in the Senate. Maybe it did and escaped my notice. But it, I think one of the reasons that that one specifically irks me is because it's kind of like the gambling bill in the sense that it seems to come up every year. The difference is I kind of feel like the gambling bill always gets a little bit closer to getting passed, whereas the constitutional carry bill has basically been in limbo since its inception. And it, it's baffling to me because I understand the sheriffs are worried about losing money, and that's the reason that they're against it. But the thing is, I believe, and, and tell me if you think I'm wrong on this, that they probably wouldn't see a difference in revenue anyway. And the reason for that is because of reciprocity. Because I, as a gun owner who has a concealed carry permit, I'm going to keep buying my permit even if I'm not required because I want to be able to have a permit when I go to Kentucky and Tennessee and Florida. And, and yeah. so th that's a protection for me. So I don't even think it would make a difference as far as revenue goes. I don't either. I don't either. And that was brought up in the hearings. And I, as a concealed carry person myself, I, right. I agree. I, I would continue to buy a, a permit as well. Yeah. So I, I don't, I don't really understand that one. And I am frustrated by the fact that even in Ruby Red, Alabama, it seems like, you know, what we've been talking about since the very beginning, it seems like there are just an awful lot of bills that you don't understand how they got through and how they just kind of whizzed through the, the House and the Senate quickly without a whole lot of pushback even in the conservative House and the Senate. And then you're looking at things that should be no-brainers in a Republican-controlled state like constitutional carry and protecting children that are born alive and botched abortions. And somehow those just never make it to the governor's desk. And I just don't understand it. I don't either. And, and that's why I just, I have this big sore on my head from hitting it against the wall <laughs> these last couple of weeks, especially because when time starts ticking down, yeah, you know, you have to work even harder, and I, I don't understand. Very frustrating. Well, you know, there's some, there are a few really great representatives in the the House and the Senate, but there's an awful lot of them that are just there for the title, and I think that that's the reason that we're, we're we get, we reap what we sow. We send those people and continue to send those people back to Montgomery, and we're getting the results from not doing our homework. And I hate to say that, but I, th I think ultimately it comes down to a lack of information from the people. Yeah. And that's one thing Eagle Forum really wants to do and is, has been trying to do is get citizens involved in this process. So we have small groups that have started all across the state, and we are working to have small groups in every legislative district so that when we have a representative going off the rails, we have people there to call and that are their constituents and mm. to maybe help them be more accountable. So critical I, race theory is one of the things we'll be working on this summer. Okay. As well as puberty is not a disease. These are presentations that we'll be doing across the state. Okay, now here, here's a big question. And this is going to be a little bit, uh, I'm going to be blindsiding you with this one, but I'm, I'm sure you'll do fine on it. I know. If there was one procedural thing that you could change about how the House and Senate is run, what would it be? Well, one thing I would like, this is not really procedural, but what I would like to see done is allow the citizens to come in the House. To come into the state house. That's a novel the, idea. The Capitol <laughs> opened on March fifteenth. Mm -hmm. You can public can go into the Capitol right across the street at the state house. No, public can't come in. It's our house, the people's house, and we weren't allowed in. That is wrong. That mm -hmm. is so wrong. So I would love to see that change. No, I absolutely agree. Is there anything else that I didn't think of that you might want to talk about? Something else you might want to let the audience know? Well, let me just. We will have a wrap up, a final. Every week, I give a legislative update during the session, mm -hmm. and this week we'll be putting out the final kind of how it ended, how our bills went, who our favorite legislators were. We're going to put that out later this week. So Eagle Forum, I'm sorry, AlabamaEagle.org is where you can find our website. On the home page, it says join our newsletter. If you click on that, you'll get on our email list, and if you do it soon, then you'll be able to see. Um, what's happening this week and kind of what our wrap-up was. Also, on our website, alabamaeagle.org, you will find an alerts tab. And there you can go and you can see all the previous emails. So if you want to find out more about VCAP or uh, any of the other bills, you can look through those uh, updates and 
find out what you missed. All right. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for being on the program, Becky. We're always glad to uh, see you back on. Hopefully next year when things are less up in the air, we'll be able to have you on weekly like we used to. That sounds great. You keep up with your studies and Thank I'm you. forward to being on again, even in the summer. Maybe we can talk some critical race theory. Oh yeah, I'd be absolutely uh, pleased as bunch to do that because that is a cancer that is infecting our schools. And I, you know, a lot of people I think in Alabama, well intended, but they think, oh, well, I don't have to worry about that because I live in Alabama. No, it's here too. It is here. All right. We'll, do that. well, thank you, Becky. I appreciate you being generous with your time. If you're watching this because you liked this video, awesome. Be sure to like and subscribe and click that little notification bell. If you're a leftist that's only here to hate watch, hang on before you punch that dislike button. You see, I identify as a Hispanic woman. So if you dislike this video, that's literally violence against me and you are now guilty of a hate crime. Why do you hate beautiful trans people of color like me? What you gonna do now, Woke Brigade?